don't know if you guys ever went back to your high school after you graduated, but it, it is a very surreal experience to walk down the halls of the school that you grew up in. And you see the same sights. You smell those same smells. Uh, some of them are good, some not so but not good. Um, and it's kind of interesting because it brings back a lot of memories, but there's this separation that happens where you feel kind of an exhilaration because you no longer are stuck there. <laughs> You're free. You're set apart from it. And so you walk through those halls and it's kind of fun to remember, but then at the same time you remember, okay, I don't have to wake up in the morning and show up. I'm not subject to all the rules. Um, one of my favorite experiences as a youth pastor was chaperoning for school dances. You know, there's nothing like the look of a high school kid when they're running down the halls, do it up to no good, and then they see their youth pastor. I love that look. Reminding them, hey, you know, don't you go to church? <laughs> But anyway, visiting high school, it reminds you, you're, you're an outsider now, but you're free. You can tell those that are in high school, you know what, it goes by fast, don't worry. I know you're tired of it, but you'll be looking back on these days as just a blip. There's life after high school, and it only gets better, at least for most of us. <laughs> well, this world is like that, for us. As we walk around this world after accepting Christ, it is a surreal experience because we used to belong to this world, but now we no longer do. We are aliens and strangers here, as it says in 1 Peter 2.9. Peter says this about you, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. Notice the, the identity. We are chosen race, a priesthood, a holy nation, God's treasure, but we're also given a purpose. Proclaim God's excellency to the world. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. Did you remember this week as you heard the news, as you went to work, as you were at school and in your neighborhoods that you were sojourners and exiles here? That this is not your home? And he goes on to say, to abstain from the passions of the flesh, the things everybody else on this earth lives for, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable or among unbelievers honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of his visitation because he is coming one day. And just like seeing your youth pastor at a school dance when you're up to no good, one day this world will see Jesus coming and there is accountability. But for us who belong to him, it's a reminder we're going home. He's coming here to save us from this messed up place. In verses 11 through 12, we see our first point. You know, realizing that we are God's children and we are citizens of heaven. We're on this earth and given a mission to share the gospel, to represent Christ. And that is for the next few weeks going to be our theme. And I would encourage you to read verses 11 through 21 of chapter five on your own. Uh, just pray through it, read it, think about it. And we'll be doing messages on it to talk about how we are ambassadors to planet earth. My son helped me with this graphic. And uh, 
So it's a good reminder. We are ambassadors on this earth. So what does that mean? What does it look like? We're going to find all out about this. So in verse 11, our first point, we are motivated. This mission that we're on, we're motivated by the fear of the Lord. In verse 11, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. And so again, therefore, always points back to what was just said, um, which we talked about the last couple of weeks. First, that we live to please God on this earth. Just like a child longs for the affirmation of their parent, and we're kind of all built with that in our hearts. So when you come to Christ, you have a desire to please him. But then we also talked about the reality that one day we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for what we did with our life as citizens of heaven on earth. And so um, were we good stewards of our time? Were we good stewards of our bodies and how we live for Jesus? So he will um, not be condemning Christians from that judgment, but rather looking at what we've presented him with our life after coming to him. Okay, so it was, as we talked about, a judgment of rewards or no rewards. And so when we talk about the fear of the Lord, this is something that is oftentimes um, foreign because we talk about the love of God a lot, but we don't talk about the fear of God a lot. When we talk about the fear of God, it's not a fear of alarm or panic. The kind of fear that people have about various things. Maybe you have a fear of heights or claustrophobic or whatever it is. It's not that kind of fear. This fear is not a fear of punishment either. In 1 John 4, 18, notice what it says. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. And so um, that kind of terror of judgment and punishment is not the fear we're talking about. So what is the fear of the Lord? Well, it's been defined as this, a reverential awe from being overwhelmed by the awesomeness of who God is. It's experience a God that is way too big, a God that overwhelms your senses and leaves you trembling. I think of the time when I was in high school and I went on a uh, climbing expedition in Canada where we started from sea level, uh, where there were no roads. We, we arrived by boat and then we went up through the foothills and up a mountain encamped on glaciers in the middle of summer to 8,500 feet, a mountain called Mount Albert. And we spent a week on this trip. But when we got to the top of the mountain, there is no way to comprehend how big the expanse that lies before you. You know, as I was looking around and we could see 360 in every direction, we were the highest thing around that we could see. And you can hear thunder, thunderous sounds from uh, avalanches off in the distance. And when you would look over that direction, you just see a little poof. At one point, we saw a plane flying below us. And it was like so hard to even find it among all the mountains, you know? And so that view was so amazing to comprehend. It was just so big and so vast. And one of the things I did, I'm not sure why, but I went to the very top and I stood at the tippy top and then I looked straight up. And man, that scared me. There was nothing between me and the heavens above, you know? <laughs> Exhilarating but enjoyable at the same time. You know, it's amazing how the fear of God is like that, but even greater. It's exhilarating, overwhelming, but enjoyable at the same time. When we think about the judgment seat of Christ, there is a certain fear that 
comes as a result. Because at that time, we're going to present ourselves to the Lord as stewards of the life that he paid for with his own blood. But just think about what that moment is like. It is like standing on the tippy top of a mountain by yourself and looking up. I think that that experience will be less about suffering loss and more about individually facing him. It'll be about seeing him as he is with nothing in between you and him and no one next to you to prop you up, you in front of the Lord. Him knowing every hidden thought, knowing you completely from the time you were conceived until the moment that you stand before him, yet still loving you fully. And so I pray that that is a glorious, joyful experience for you when you stand before Jesus of overwhelming awe and trembling pleasure. I think even if you are rewarded greatly at that time, it will seem insignificant compared to being welcomed into his awesome presence. So fear, the fear of the Lord is responding to Jesus in accordance with who he is. If you truly realized, if you truly saw and understood, you would be floored. Fear is a good thing in the right context and especially the fear of the Lord. In Proverbs 9, 10, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you wanna be wise, it starts here. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. If you've been with us through the book of Isaiah on Wednesday nights, Isaiah 33, 5 says, The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with justice and righteousness, and he will be the stability of your times. You know, if you fear God, you fear nothing else. (laughs) If you want courage in this world, then Fear the Lord. That's where our courage begins. Abundance of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. But notice what it says. The fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. Oh, you mean it's not the Ark of the Covenant? It's not the golden vessels? No, the fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. Do you treasure the fear of the Lord? Just like you treasure climbing a mountain or going to the ocean and standing there with the waves crashing in front of you and being in awe, do you see the fear of the Lord as a treasure? In Hebrews 12, 28, it says, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Godly fear is what we're talking about. And in, if you really fear the Lord, it becomes the motivation for persuading others. Not only because of that one day where we stand before him, but when you know the awesomeness of God and that he invites you to experience him, where he is way too big for you to comprehend, you get so pumped about that, you're like, hey, come check this out. You gotta try it. You gotta climb up there and look straight up in the sky. It'll freak you out, you know? It'll overwhelm you. And so we persuade others, which means that we persuade, we urge people to put their faith in Christ. We persuade them because we fear God. We tell them what God's word says about Jesus. We tell them the truth of the gospel, that Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. Out of the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. You know what? The time is short. Jesus is coming back. Today is the day of salvation. The opportunity to experience salvation is coming to an end. The time 
to be saved from hell, to be saved from that second resurrection that leads to the condemnation judgment before the great white throne, to be saved from the second death in the lake of fire, the opportunity is coming to an end. The end times are being played out before our very eyes. It has begun and the stage is being set right now for the events in the book of Revelation. So we persuade others, it's time to repent and to believe in Jesus. It's time to turn. That's what repent means is just turn away from going your own direction, turn to your creator and your savior. Even Jesus told the story to persuade people to believe now because there will not be an opportunity after death. In Luke 16, 19, I want to read it to you because this is from Jesus himself. He says, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. And by the way, this is before Christ was resurrected and he led the captives into heaven with himself. Before that happened, the righteous dead went into a place called Abraham's side. And it says the rich man also delivered or also died and was buried and in Hades or hell, place of the dead. Being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in his like, or in like manner, bad things. But now he's comforted here. He was of the righteous dead. And you are in anguish. And besides all this, between you, between us and you, there's a great chasm fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to here. And so those who would teach there's an opportunity after death to cross over to the other side, it is not possible. And he said, then I beg you, Father, to send him that's the dead Lazarus, uh, to my father's house, for I have five brothers so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, no deal, dude. He said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead, which Jesus did do. That is a reason to persuade others when you look at the possible outcome of the lives of those who do not know Jesus. And so God leaves us here on this earth as ambassadors sent from heaven to persuade others. And so while they are alive, it's not the dead that are raised to warn them about hell. It's you who are sent from heaven to persuade them to receive Christ. And it goes on, but what we are is known to God and I hope it is known also to your conscience. And so after that great statement, Paul then goes into an explanation of what kind of teacher do you listen to? He says, you know, about himself and the other apostles, those that are serving with Paul, 
uh, that what they are, what they truly are in their hearts is known to God. Um, it's clearly revealed to God that Paul has nothing to prove and nothing to be ashamed of in doing ministry. And so he does it with a Christ-like character and with pure motives. And so he's hoping the Corinthians will recognize true teachers, true ambassadors from heaven versus the false ones. We're told in the end times, there'll be many false teachers. So we need to be able to recognize who they are. And so Paul continues on in verse 12. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. And there's the key to understanding the difference between a true and a false teacher. False teachers focused on outward appearance. And that phrase outward appearance literally means face, you know? They put on a certain face. The ministry of false teachers, or you can call it the ministry of the world, takes great pride in appearance with flashy, breathtaking experiences that keep people coming back with numbers and money and personality. You see, it's all about compensating outwardly for what is lacking inwardly. And people fall for it. Those who are of the world fall for it. You know, those who are in love with the world fall for it. The false apostles in Paul's time and Paul jokingly calls them super apostles because that's how they saw themselves. Um, an apostle with Superman outfit with a big A, super apostles. They boasted in their prosperity, in their health, in their oratory skills, in their family connections, in their status in society. We learn about them in 1 Corinthians as well as 2 Corinthians. Um, they were very pragmatic. They did things that worked versus being genuine in doing things in the power of the Spirit. They were greedy. They did what they did for money, for influence. They were self-focused. They presented themselves as powerful leaders, you know? 2 Corinthians 11.20 Paul calls the Corinthians on wanting powerful leaders over them. And he says this, for you bear it, or you put up with it, if someone makes slaves of you, or devours you, or takes advantage of you, or puts on airs, or strikes you in the face. That's messed up. And so these false teachers put on a front not only of great wealth and prosperity and importance and power, but also with this heavy handedness. And people are drawn to that kind of leadership. A couple of years back, I had our staff read a book called um, The Way of the Dragon or The Way of the Lamb. That's what it looks like. Um, the way of the dragon and the way of the lamb. Basically talking about ministry can be done in the way of the world, the way of the dragon, in the wisdom of the world or the way of the lamb, the way of Christ, humility and love. So these false prophets were not impressed with Paul because he followed the way of the lamb. The false teachers followed the way of the dragon. In 2 Corinthians 10.10, 10, this is what they said about Paul. His, weight, his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak, and his speech is of no account. And so they were like, man, Paul is an unimpressive guy. I am not um, lifted up in our society by saying Paul is my friend, and therefore I'm not going to be associated with him. But Paul says, don't be fooled. Here we have the outward appearance 
versus what is truly in the heart. The world follows the outward appearance, but we know better. We know that what is truly in the heart is what God is looking at. When you see the word heart in the New Testament, it is the Greek word cardia, you know, which we know is literally the heart, but figuratively it is this. It's the location of a person's thoughts, will, emotions, and conscience, the knowledge of right and wrong. It's that inner person that drives all that you are. And so false teachers, they were attractive, but they had a worldly heart, a heart that was prideful, selfish, and rebellious. But what kind of heart does God look for? in an apostle like Paul. What kind of heart is he looking for in you? Well, we see it in, in the scriptures in 1 Samuel 16, 7, when Samuel was sent by God to pick the king of Israel and he showed up to Jesse's household and saw all of his sons, you know, he saw kind of the older, the, the bigger, the more powerful looking ones. And he's like, oh, surely this is the next king of Israel. And God's like, nope, not that one. And he goes through them all and he's like, okay, God, then what's up? And God says, hey, there's a little red-haired brother out in the fields that everybody forgot about that's watching the sheep. That's the one I choose. And so this is what God said to Samuel. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. God's like, I rejected the older brother, but I see this, this one who has a heart after me, who is a true worshiper and fears me more than giants. That's the heart I want. And so Paul, though unimpressive, he had the right heart. On the inside, he was the guy God chose for a reason. And so we have in ourselves, in our inner person, a new covenant glory that shines from the inside out, not from the outside in, from the inside out. And we learned all about that in the last chapter in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 5. It says, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord. With ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Notice that. Instead of powerful, domineering leaders, we are your servants. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we, having this treasure in jars of clay, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Your bodies are like jars of clay, earthen vessels, but what God has done on the inside through the gospel, through the presence of Jesus Christ, through the fact that he's made you a new creation, you have treasures in jars of clay. God desires for us not to take pride in the outside, but the, to find the confidence on the inside by having the right heart and doing ministry out of the right motivation. So why do we share the gospel with the world? You know, oftentimes we talk about evangelism and then there's that tinge of guilt right off the bat that maybe you've experienced and you're like, man, I'm failing miserably with sharing Jesus with people. And Maybe it's the guilt, maybe it's the fear, but it kind of makes us not want to hear about it again because we don't want to go through that whole rigmarole of guilt and shame. But notice that when our hearts are in the right place on the inside and we are filled with the treasure in these earthen vessels and we are treasuring the fear of the Lord, that the fear of the Lord becomes a motivation that changes why you share Christ with people. It's not because the pastor made you feel guilty. It's because 
you see God is so overwhelmingly awesome. You can't help yourself. God desires that we would fear him, put him first, experience the greatness of who he is so that it would transform the way we live. You know, a lot of times in in our walk, we get away with impressing people with what we know. Like in in a, a small group setting or learning certain facts, memorizing certain things. Um, But what God is looking for is so much more than just what we know. Do you truly believe what you know? Do you truly experience the God you proclaim on a personal level when you pray? Do you come into his presence and fall before him figuratively or literally in worship? Do you experience him? Do you have a relationship with him? Nobody wants to be a follower of a religious person, ultimately. People are looking for what is real and genuine. And when we don't have that in our own lives, and if you don't, you're probably keenly aware of it, and maybe you try to trick yourself or trick others that, you know, you're, you're doing well. But when you have a fear of the Lord, it, it's a sign of something super healthy going on in your relationship with God. Because you're able to pray like Jesus taught us when he said, pray like this, our Father in heaven. And so you're able to come before him as your Father We have the spirit inside of us that cries, Abba, Father, the spirit of sonship. But we also pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And at the same time, we're overwhelmed with how holy he is, how infinite he is. And so the fear of the Lord is all encapsulated in that. Well, apparently today we're only going to go over point number one (laughs) because I don't want to miss. I don't want to like add a bunch more information on top of this one. I want to encourage you today with this application. Experience the fear of the Lord. Don't just talk about it or, or know about it, but experience the fear of the Lord and allow it to inspire you to persuade others to turn to Jesus. Maybe on their behalf, you can think about the fear they will face one day, that fear of condemnation, you know, the true, that, that kind of fear that leads to death. And you can pray for them. But really, it's your fear your reverence that's going to motivate you the best, the most, and transform you on this earth. We need the fear of the Lord in our lives. So how can you do that this week? Take some time to sit before him and pray. One of my favorite things to do when we actually have clear skies is sit near a window where I can see the stars because I'm, you know, up early most of the time with my good friend Espresso and we're hanging out with Jesus and I'm praying and looking up and just going, man, God, you are so amazing. Sometimes we're just so quick. I got to read my chapter. I got to pray through my list and, but we didn't take time to stand at the top of the mountain and look up. And for just that moment, experience an overwhelming pleasure that also makes you tremble before the living God. You know, we need that in our worship. We need that in our prayer. And it begins with you alone with him. And it will ooze on into church 
you know, when we're together, but it begins when you are alone with him. And so find a time, maybe at night, maybe in the morning, maybe at lunch, I don't know, but a time where you can just let everything else in your life go by the wayside and you can spend time with your heavenly father. You can approach him in his throne of grace in the name of Christ because of what he did for you on the cross. And you can not only enjoy his presence and worship him, but you can also bring your requests to him. And he has mercy on you. He cares for you. So don't do this thing that a lot of people do. And they're like, well, God's too busy for me. You know, there's too many other people that have bigger things. Da, 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 da. Knock it off. God is infinite. Do you really understand who he is? <laughs> that there is a whole universe of his relationship with just you as well as with me and everybody else because he's infinite. Infinite thoughts about you, infinite love for you. Come before him. Come before him and fear him. And let that fear go into your day as you're driving on the road you fear him so much that somebody cuts you off and you're like, yeah, it's no big deal. I've experienced greater things today. That you can go to work and stand for Jesus and you can say, you know what? I have courage because I fear God and not you. Boss man or <laughs> whoever it is. You know, I love how Paul, he, he didn't fear man and he, he went to prison a couple times, a <laughs> few times. Why? Because he feared God more than man. Could it be that we're entering an age where we need to learn the fear of the Lord because we need courage in what is coming? What is coming? But I can guarantee you this, God enjoys spending time with you. And if you slow down and spend time with him, he'll bless you. He'll take you into his presence. And that's why the scripture says, ask, seek, and knock. And God will come through. That's my paraphrased version. So, well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for inviting us into your presence that you would reveal yourself to us and not consume us at the same time. But Lord, we, we pray that you would help us to know you, to love you and fear you in the way that it becomes our great treasure. Lord, we ask that you would take your word and, and show us who you are. That by your spirit, you would open our eyes and, and show us who you are. You do something in our hearts, new and fresh and life-giving as we learn to fear you. And Lord, especially we pray that that would impact the lives around us so that we don't have to put on the appearance of things, but the inside that is genuine oozes out into everything that we are. Lord, let that be the motivation for why we persuade others. You got to come and meet this God that is way too big. He's awesome. Lord, let that be the cry of our heart. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.